everyone and welcome back. Today we are talking about political parties, uh, one of the political institutions that is perhaps the most important in uh, understanding American politics today relative to the way that we thought about American politics at the founding of the United States and at the ratification of the Constitution. Um, so just to kind of orient the things that we're talking about today, um, certainly those of you who are paying any attention to what's going on in American politics today is certainly aware that we have two political parties. Um, and generally, I think we think about those parties from the perspective of party elites. So by that I mean politicians who have R's and D's next to their names, you know, key organizers and people who work for campaigns. Uh, but really the thing that I want to talk about in this video is the fact that parties are not just about these uh, politicians and elites and people who work for the political parties, parties are also composed of citizens, of, of average Americans, who uh, simply identify with, uh, with a specific political party, who call themselves Republicans or Democrats. And really, uh, very much like a religious affiliation, if someone were to call themselves a Catholic or an Episcopalian or a Presbyterian or something, right? this group identification ultimately serves to affect what you do and how you feel about uh, politics. And so when we get into this, when we think about this idea of party identification as a concept, this is one of the most important concepts that we'll talk about this uh, semester. It helps to, to maybe explain some of the weird stuff that early uh, researchers were discovering about public opinion that we talked about last time. Because if you recall, we saw that uh, early public opinion researchers found that uh, people's opinions seemed to sort of swing around like crazy, um, almost as if people were simply guessing on various uh, public opinion items. Of course, in those videos in the module, we described a variety of different reasons um, why people may have uh, given unstable answers across time to many survey, uh, survey uh, uh, questions. And certainly, if you don't remember some of those reasons, uh, it's not just that voters are stupid for, for any stretch of the imagination. Go back to those modules and check out uh, some of the reasons why, especially the idea of response and stability stemming from things like measurement error, uh, but, but above that, uh, things like the top of the head response model. But in contrast to this top of the head response kind of, uh, kind of world in which people's opinions on the issues are very variable, it turns out that these, these early researchers also found at the same time that when we asked people about their perceptions towards the two major parties, that very many people didn't change their minds at all when it came to those specific opinions. So if we ask people, hey, what do you think about healthcare? What do you think about you know, crime? What do you think about this and that? Um, they would change their answer all the time. But if we ask people, what are your, uh, part, what, what's your party identification? Which party do you feel closer to? They would consistently over time give the same answer over and over. And really no amount of campaigning ultimately could sway this latent attachment. One of the reasons why early researchers were sort of um, surprised to discover that voting uh, really isn't like choosing between quest, Crest and Aquafresh toothpaste. Right? It's not, it's not, um, it's not a, a choice between two sort of brands that are almost the same. Uh, people have these latent psychological attachments to a specific party and that colors their interpretation of the rest of reality. And so with that kind of framework in mind, thinking about party ID as being so stable and so difficult to sway, American political scientists, especially at the University of Michigan, started to think about what we might call a funnel of causality, a model or a framework for understanding why people vote the way that they do. And at the very back of this sort of uh, funnel-shaped thing are these strong bedrock drivers of group identities and loyalties, all of the sort of demographics and the sort of the, the weight of history, all of these long-term sort of forces that have come to help to explain why um, the, the two parties appeal to different kinds of people in the electorate. Um, and at the very front of the, of the funnel is stuff that might happen just a few days before the election. You know, you might see a campaign ad, uh, somebody might be talking about a specific issue in a rally, a stump speech, uh, these little sort of uh, cues, right? These top of the head kind of uh, things that you might remember as you go into the ballot box to vote or when you cast your ballot um, in some other way, either you know, by mail or dropping it off in a drop box. And so those kind of front end things, these sort of minimal campaign effects and all kinds of other things, you know, that maybe the stock market crashes the day before the election, these things do have a real impact on the way that people vote. But in the middle, between these bedrock drivers, the things, the group identities, the kinds of uh, things that we call ourselves, the kind of um, identities that we have that are important to us, and these, you know, very close to the election kind of minimal forces, we have party ID in the middle. 
party ID being this most important kind of, uh, again, the idea is that this is the unmoved mover in the funnel of causality. And so again, um, these, these uh, uh, political scientists were thinking about how the economic structure and social and historical divisions help to play a part, right? Long-term forces, things that are hundreds of years maybe in the making, go towards um, influencing the kinds of groups that you're loyal to and how you describe yourself, what kind of identities you have, um, and also your values, right? What you hold to be the most important values um, in, your, in your belief system. All of those things are gonna come together to sort of form a single expression in terms of your party attachment. And then um, from there, party attachment actually again, critically, has an impact itself on your perceptions of the issues and the candidates and the events of the day. So this is why we considered party attachment to be an unmoved mover, because a lot of this stuff doesn't move backwards to inf impact party attachment as much as party attachment moves forwards to impact our perceptions of the whole campaign itself. And so hundreds of years of history combine to influence why we identify with specific parties. And once we develop that specific party attachment, we feel like we're closely identified with either the Republicans or the Democrats. Once that happens, then we start to see the entire world through the lens of our party. And we start to uh, think about the issues through the lens of party. We start to think about the candidates and how, you know, what we think about them, what we like about them uh, through the lens of party. Uh, some other things could come in, come in here exogenously or sort of from outside and influence us, like the campaigns and the conditions of the economy. But really the through line here, the big driver, all the way back from history essentially, is the party attachment that has the strongest and most central impact on the way we vote. And of course, this, this doesn't seem too outlandish if you think about it, right? Because of course, Democrats tend to vote for Democratic candidates, Republicans tend to vote for Republican candidates. But part of the reason why these other things, like the campaigns and the economy and issue opinions um, and all this other stuff, doesn't seem to impact uh, Republicans or Democrats that much, why Republicans are very reticent to cross the aisle to vote for Democratic candidates and why Democrats are very reticent to cross the aisle and vote for Republican candidates is largely because this party attachment has already been formed and represents this filter uh, through which we interpret the rest of the campaign. So the funnel of causality is a really important concept to understanding voting behavior. And I think it's really important also to remember that these individuals who are sort of subject to this, this central driver, they're partisans and they're, they form part of the party system. So again, uh, just to sort of recap this funnel of causality, it, it's famous, it's a very important graphic, it's a very important concept in voting behavior because really if you think about it, it shows how little politics or right, all the pageantry of the campaigns actually affect voting for the vast majority of people. Many people have made up their minds, they've decided who, the, who they're going to vote for essentially years before a given election, right? As long as they know who's the R candidate and who's the D candidate, that's going to be the deciding factor in their vote. And so, again, partisanship is the core reason for this phenomenon. It's the core reason why elections are fairly stable in our, in our politics. And it's the core reason why um, you know, we, can, we can make forecasts of, the, of elections with any degree of accuracy. Because we, we can bank on the fact that partisans are going to interpret the election one way or the other. But again, if you think about it, it's actually maybe a little bit of an overstatement to say that party is the only thing that affects elections. Right? We're, we're saying, you know, Partisanship has this massive impact on all of our other attitudes, like, for example, our opinions on various specific issues as expressed in surveys. And so, you know, certainly it's, it's quite likely, you know, think about this, right? It's quite likely that somebody's going to retain a party identification once they've adopted it. I mean, for example, let's imagine uh, somebody who's like a diehard Ravens fan. The likelihood that they wake up, you know, on the wrong side of the bed the, the next morning and say, you know, I think I'm going to renounce my Ravens fandom and become a Steelers fan, it just doesn't seem that plausible, right? Most people are going to continue to be partisans because they have this psychological attachment. They're fans of the team, essentially. They're really bought in to this idea that their team is the good, the good guys and the other team is the bad guys. Um, and so this kind of psychological attachment means that people are going to be very unlikely to change their partisanship. However, partisanship does change over time. And this is a very blurry image of a thing called macro partisanship, which essentially is the share of Democrats to, to Republicans in the electorate. Uh, this particular graphic um, from, from Stimson and other scholars goes from the 50s to the early 2010s. 
you can see that it really has shifted a lot over time, right? It's, um, there were certain times in the 1970s when um, the, the electorate was highly democratic. There were a lot of democratic identifiers. Going into the 80s and kind of the Reagan revolution, we saw that the electorate became a lot more Republican. And then uh, in the 2000s, we saw again that, that um, sort of we're in this middle period where there's a now sort of a balance between this highly democratic and highly Republican period. So, um, of course, this is one of the reasons why our elections are so darn close right now, right, is that there's this very, very uh, competitive balance of Republicans and Democrats in the electorate. So partisanship does change over time. It seems to actually move to some extent, and that might be for a variety of reasons. So again, you know, you might be already thinking about this and saying, well, of course, partisanship is going to change. It's because some people, you know, sadly pass away and they reach the ends, ends of their lives and, and then new people are born and new people turn 18 and come of age and they have different opinions and ideas about politics than the generations that preceded them. Certainly, that's a generational replacement. Uh, it turns out that this change, this macro partisanship trend, actually is greater than the effects of generational replacement alone, which means that some people are, in fact, moving. From Republicans to Democrats and vice versa. And I think to, to understand this uh, instability, relative instability in um, party attachments over time, we need to back up. And in the next video, I'm going to be uh, talking in a lot more detail about how we conceptualize political parties, what political parties really are, and how that conceptualization might help us to better understand why from the micro level to the macro level uh, we appear to observe this shift over time, this gentle shift in the balance of Republicans and Democrats in the electorate. And really just to, to preview the coming attractions here, we can think about this from the perspective of what we call the tripartite model of political parties. That is to say that a political party is not just one thing, it's actually three distinct institutions at least. Uh, one being the party in government, that is people who actually hold office, the people who have R's and D's next to their name and sit in Congress and in other you know, state houses and in the presidency and other places in, in government. The second being the party as institution. This is people who are not elected officials, but are actually sort of workers for the party who are formally um, sort of on the payrolls of parties or activists who are working in a pro bono or a volunteer capacity to try to elect candidates. And then finally, this third group, which we've been talking about th during this video, the party and electorate, that being just ordinary people, citizens who identify as partisans and have that strong psychological attachment to the parties. So this tripartite, again, tripartite means three-part or three-piece. This three-piece tripartite model of parties, I think, is going to go a long way in helping us to understand why it is that we observe instability in the party and electorate over time, uh, especially as we think about how these two forces uh, have an influence on the way that the party and electorate thinks and behaves. So until the next video, um, have a great one, and I uh, look forward to talking to you more about this wacky thing we have that maybe the framers didn't expect called the political party system. <laughs>